Victoria Alexandrina Victoria the 24th of May 1819 to the 22nd of January 1901 was queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland from the 20th of June 1837 until her death On the 1st of May 1876 she adopted the additional title of Empress of India Victoria was the daughter of Prince Edward Duke of Kent and Strathern the fourth son of King George III both the Duke and the King died in 1820, and Victoria was raised under close supervision by her mother, Princess Victoria of Saxe Coburg Salfeld. She inherited the throne at the age of 18, after her father's three elder brothers had all died, leaving no surviving legitimate children. The United Kingdom was already an established constitutional monarchy, in which the sovereign held relatively little direct political power. Privately, Victoria attempted to influence government policy and ministerial appointments. Publicly, she became a national icon who was identified with strict standards of personal morality. Victoria married her first cousin Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha in 1840. Their nine children married into royal and noble families across the continent, tying them together and earning her the sobriquet, the Grandmother of Europe. After Albert's death in 1861, Victoria plunged into deep mourning and avoided public appearances. As a result of her seclusion, republicanism temporarily gained strength, but in the latter half of her reign, her popularity recovered. Her golden and diamond jubilees were times of public celebration. Her reign of 63 years and seven months was longer than that of any of her predecessors and is known as the Victorian era. It was a period of industrial, cultural, political, scientific, and military change within the United Kingdom, and was marked by a great expansion of the British Empire. She was the last British monarch of the House of Hanover. Her son and successor, Edward VII, initiated the House of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, the line of his father. <laughs> Birth and family Victoria's father was Prince Edward, Duke of Kent and Strathern, the fourth son of the reigning King of the United Kingdom, George III. Until 1817, Edward's niece, Princess Charlotte of Wales, was the only legitimate grandchild of George III. Her death in 1817 precipitated a succession crisis that brought pressure on the Duke of Kent and his unmarried brothers to marry and have children. In 1818 he married Princess Victoria of saxe coburg salfeld a widowed German princess with two children. Karl (1804–1856) and Theodora (1807–1872) by her first marriage to the Prince of Leiningen. Her brother Leopold was Princess Charlotte's widower. The Duke and Duchess of Kent's only child, Victoria, was born at 4:15 a.m. on the 24th of May 1819 at Kensington Palace in London. Victoria was christened privately by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Charles Manners Sutton, on the 24th of June 1819 in the Cupola Room at Kensington Palace. She was baptized Alexandrina after one of her godparents, Emperor Alexander I of Russia, and Victoria after her mother. Additional names proposed by her parents. Georgina or Georgiana, Charlotte, and Augusta were dropped on the instructions of Kent's eldest brother, George, the Prince Regent. At birth, Victoria was fifth in the line of succession after the four eldest sons of George III, George, the Prince Regent, later George IV, Frederick, the Duke of York, William, the Duke of Clarence, later William IV, and Victoria's father, Edward, the Duke of Kent. The Prince Regent had no surviving children, and the Duke of York had no children. Further, both were estranged from their wives, who were both past child-bearing age, so the two eldest brothers were unlikely to have any further children. The Duke of Clarence and the Duke of Kent married on the same day in 1818, but both of Clarence's legitimate daughters born in 1819 and 1820 died as infants. Victoria's father died in January 1820, when Victoria was less than a year old. A week later her grandfather died and was succeeded by his eldest son, George IV. The Duke of York died in 1827. When George IV died in 1830, he was succeeded by his next surviving brother, William IV, and Victoria became heir presumptive. The Regency Act 1830 made special provision for Victoria's mother to act as regent in case William died while Victoria was still a minor. King William distrusted the Duchess's capacity to be regent, and in 1836 he declared in her presence that he wanted to live until Victoria's 18th birthday, so that a regency could be avoided. Heir presumptive 
Victoria later described her childhood as rather melancholy. Her mother was extremely protective, and Victoria was raised largely isolated from other children under the so-called Kensington system. An elaborate set of rules and protocols devised by the Duchess and her ambitious and domineering controller, Sir John Conroy, who was rumoured to be the Duchess's lover. The system prevented the princess from meeting people whom her mother and Conroy deemed undesirable including most of her father's family, and was designed to render her weak and dependent upon them. The Duchess avoided the court because she was scandalised by the presence of King William's illegitimate children, and perhaps prompted the emergence of Victorian morality by insisting that her daughter avoid any appearance of sexual impropriety. Victoria shared a bedroom with her mother every night, studied with private tutors to a regular timetable, and spent her play hours with her dolls and her King Charles Spaniel, Dash. Her lessons included French, German, Italian, and Latin, but she spoke only English at home. In 1830, the Duchess of Kent and Conroy took Victoria across the centre of England to visit the Malvern Hills, stopping at towns and great country houses along the way. Similar journeys to other parts of England and Wales were taken in 1832, 1833, 1834 and 1835. To the King's annoyance, Victoria was enthusiastically welcomed in each of the stops. William compared the journeys to royal progresses and was concerned that they portrayed Victoria as his rival rather than his heir presumptive. Victoria disliked the trips, the constant round of public appearances made her tired and ill, and there was little time for her to rest. She objected on the grounds of the king's disapproval, but her mother dismissed his complaints as motivated by jealousy and forced Victoria to continue the tours. At Ramsgate in October 1835, Victoria contracted a severe fever, which Conroy initially dismissed as a childish pretense. While Victoria was ill, Conroy and the Duchess unsuccessfully badgered her to make Conroy her private secretary. As a teenager, Victoria resisted persistent attempts by her mother and Conroy to appoint him to her staff. Once queen, she banned him from her presence, but he remained in her mother's household. By 1836, the Duchess's brother, Leopold, who had been King of the Belgians since 1831, hoped to marry his niece to his nephew, Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Leopold, Victoria's mother, and Albert's father, Ernest I, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, were siblings. Leopold arranged for Victoria's mother to invite her Coburg relatives to visit her in May 1836, with the purpose of introducing Victoria to Albert. William IV, however, disapproved of any match with the Coburgs, and instead favoured the suit of Prince Alexander of the Netherlands, second son of the Prince of Orange. Victoria was aware of the various matrimonial plans and critically appraised a parade of eligible princes. According to her diary, she enjoyed Albert's company from the beginning. After the visit she wrote, Albert is extremely handsome, his hair is about the same color as mine, his eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth, but the charm of his countenance is his expression, which is most delightful." Alexander, on the other hand, she described as, "...very plain." Victoria wrote to her uncle Leopold, whom Victoria considered her, "...best and kindest adviser," to thank him. For the prospect of great happiness you have contributed to give me, in the person of dear Albert. He possesses every quality that could be desired to render me perfectly happy. He is so sensible, so kind, and so good, and so amiable too. He has besides the most pleasing and delightful exterior and appearance you can possibly see." However at seventeen, Victoria, though interested in Albert, was not yet ready to marry. The parties did not undertake a formal engagement, but assumed that the match would take place in due time. <inaudible> Early reign Victoria turned 18 on 24 May 1837, and a regency was avoided. Less than a month later, on 20 June 1837, William IV died at the age of 71, and Victoria became Queen of the United Kingdom. In her diary she wrote, I was awoke at six o'clock by Mama, who told me the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Conningham were here and wished to see me. I got out of bed and went into my sitting room only in my dressing gown and alone, and saw them. Lord Conningham then acquainted me that my poor uncle, the King, was no more, and had expired at twelve minutes past two this morning, and consequently that I am Queen. 
Official documents prepared on the first day of her reign described her as Alexandrina Victoria, but the first name was withdrawn at her own wish and not used again. Since 1714, Britain had shared a monarch with Hanover in Germany, but under Salic law, women were excluded from the Hanoverian succession. While Victoria inherited all the British dominions, her father's younger brother, her unpopular uncle the Duke of Cumberland, became King of Hanover. He was her heir presumptive while she was childless. At the time of Victoria's accession, the government was led by the Whig Prime Minister Lord Melbourne. The Prime Minister at once became a powerful influence on the politically inexperienced Queen, who relied on him for advice. Charles Greville supposed that the widowed and childless Melbourne was passionately fond of her as he might be of his daughter if he had one." And Victoria probably saw him as a father figure. Her coronation took place on 28 June 1838 at Westminster Abbey. Over 400,000 visitors came to London for the celebrations. She became the first sovereign to take up residence at Buckingham Palace and inherited the revenues of the duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall as well as being granted a civil list allowance of £385,000 per year. Financially prudent, she paid off her father's debts. At the start of her reign, Victoria was popular, but her reputation suffered in an 1839 court intrigue when one of her mother's ladies in waiting, Lady Flora Hastings, developed an abdominal growth that was widely rumoured to be an out of wedlock pregnancy by Sir John Conroy. Victoria believed the rumours. She hated Conroy, and despised that odious Lady Flora because she had conspired with Conroy and the Duchess of Kent in the Kensington system. At first, Lady Flora refused to submit to an intimate medical examination, until in mid-February she eventually agreed, and was found to be a virgin. Conroy, the Hastings family, and the opposition Tories organised a press campaign implicating the Queen in the spreading of false rumours about Lady Flora. When Lady Flora died in July, the post-mortem revealed a large tumour on her liver that had distended her abdomen. At public appearances, Victoria was hissed and jeered as Mrs. Melbourne. In 1839, Melbourne resigned after radicals and Tories, both of whom Victoria detested, voted against a bill to suspend the Constitution of Jamaica. The bill removed political power from plantation owners who were resisting measures associated with the abolition of slavery. The Queen commissioned a Tory, Sir Robert Peel, to form a new ministry. At the time, it was customary for the Prime Minister to appoint members of the royal household, who were usually his political allies and their spouses. Many of the Queen's ladies of the bedchamber were wives of Whigs, and Peel expected to replace them with wives of Tories. In what became known as the Bedchamber Crisis, Victoria, advised by Melbourne, objected to their removal. Peel refused to govern under the restrictions imposed by the Queen, and consequently resigned his commission, allowing Melbourne to return to office. Topic marriage Though Victoria was now queen, as an unmarried young woman she was required by social convention to live with her mother, despite their differences over the Kensington system and her mother's continued reliance on Conroy. Her mother was consigned to a remote apartment in Buckingham Palace, and Victoria often refused to see her. When Victoria complained to Melbourne that her mother's close proximity promised torment for many years, Melbourne sympathised but said it could be avoided by marriage, which Victoria called a «shocking» sick alternative. Victoria showed interest in Albert's education for the future role he would have to play as her husband, but she resisted attempts to rush her into wedlock. Victoria continued to praise Albert following his second visit in October 1839. Albert and Victoria felt mutual affection, and the Queen proposed to him on 15 October 1839, just five days after he had arrived at Windsor. They were married on 10 February 1840, in the Chapel Royal of St. James's Palace, London. Victoria was love-struck. She spent the evening after their wedding lying down with a headache, but wrote ecstatically in her diary, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest dearest dear Albert, his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms, and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness and gentleness, really how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband, to be called by names of tenderness, I have never yet heard used to me before, was bliss beyond belief. Oh. This was the happiest day of my life. Albert became an important political advisor as well as the Queen's companion, replacing Lord Melbourne as the dominant influential figure in the first half of her life. Victoria's mother was evicted from the palace, to ingest her house in Belgrave Square. 
After the death of Victoria's aunt, Princess Augusta, in 1840, Victoria's mother was given both Clarence and Frogmore houses. Through Albert's mediation, relations between mother and daughter slowly improved. During Victoria's first pregnancy in 1840, in the first few months of the marriage, 18-year-old Edward Oxford attempted to assassinate her while she was riding in a carriage with Prince Albert on her way to visit her mother. Oxford fired twice, but either both bullets missed or, as he later claimed, the guns had no shot. He was tried for high treason, found not guilty on the grounds of insanity, committed to an insane asylum indefinitely, and later sent to live in Australia. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, Victoria's popularity soared, mitigating residual discontent over the Hastings affair and the bedchamber crisis. Her daughter, also named Victoria, was born on 21 November 1840. The Queen hated being pregnant, viewed breastfeeding with disgust, and thought newborn babies were ugly. Nevertheless, over the following 17 years, she and Albert had a further eight children, Albert Edward B. 1841, Alice B. 1843, Alfred B. 1844, Helena B. 1846, Louise B. 1848, Arthur B. 1850, Leopold B. 1853 and Beatrice B. 1857. Victoria's household was largely run by her childhood governess, Baroness Louise Lezen from Hanover. Lezen had been a formative influence on Victoria and had supported her against the Kensington system. Albert, however, thought that Lezen was incompetent and that her mismanagement threatened his daughter's health. After a furious row between Victoria and Albert over the issue, Lezen was pensioned off in 1842, and Victoria's close relationship with her ended. 1842–1860 On 29 May 1842, Victoria was riding in a carriage along the Mall, London, when John Francis aimed a pistol at her, but the gun did not fire. The assailant escaped, however the following day, Victoria drove the same route, though faster and with a greater escort, in a deliberate attempt to provoke Francis to take a second aim and catch him in the act. As expected, Francis shot at her, but he was seized by plainclothes policemen, and convicted of high treason. On 3 July, two days after Francis's death sentence was commuted to transportation for life, John William Bean also tried to fire a pistol at the Queen, but it was loaded only with paper and tobacco and had too little charge. Edward Oxford felt that the attempts were encouraged by his acquittal in 1840. Bean was sentenced to 18 months in jail. In a similar attack in 1849, unemployed Irishman William Hamilton fired a powder-filled pistol at Victoria's carriage as it passed along Constitution Hill, London. In 1850, the Queen did sustain injury when she was assaulted by a possibly insane ex-army officer, Robert Pate. As Victoria was riding in a carriage, Pate struck her with his cane, crushing her bonnet and bruising her forehead. Both Hamilton and Pate were sentenced to seven years' transportation. Melbourne's support in the House of Commons weakened through the early years of Victoria's reign, and in the 1841 general election the Whigs were defeated. Peel became Prime Minister, and the ladies of the bedchamber most associated with the Whigs were replaced. In 1845, Ireland was hit by a potato blight. In the next four years, over a million Irish people died and another million emigrated in what became known as the Great Famine. In Ireland, Victoria was labelled the Famine Queen. In January 1847 she personally donated £2,000 equivalent to between £178,000 and £6.5 million in 2016 to the British Relief Association, more than any other individual famine relief donor, and also supported the Maynooth Grant to a Roman Catholic seminary in Ireland, despite Protestant opposition. The story that she donated only £5 in aid to the Irish, and on the same day gave the same amount to Battersea Dogs Home, was a myth generated towards the end of the 19th century. By 1846, Peel's ministry faced a crisis involving the repeal of the Corn Laws. Many Tories by then known also as Conservatives were opposed to the repeal, but Peel, some Tories, the Peelites, most Whigs and Victoria supported it. Peel resigned in 1846, after the repeal narrowly passed, and was replaced by Lord John Russell. Internationally, Victoria took a keen interest in the improvement of relations between France and Britain. She made and hosted several visits between the British royal family and the House of Orleans, who were related by marriage through the Coburgs. 
In 1843 and 1845, she and Albert stayed with King Louis Philippe I at Chateau du in Normandy. She was the first British or English monarch to visit a French monarch since the meeting of Henry VIII of England and Francis I of France on the Field of the Cloth of Gold in 1520. When Louis Philippe made a reciprocal trip in 1844, he became the first French king to visit a British sovereign. Louis Philippe was deposed in the revolutions of 1848, and fled to exile in England. At the height of a revolutionary scare in the United Kingdom in April 1848, Victoria and her family left London for the greater safety of Osborne House, a private estate on the Isle of Wight that they had purchased in 1845 and redeveloped. Demonstrations by Chartists and Irish nationalists failed to attract widespread support, and the scare died down without any major disturbances. Victoria's first visit to Ireland in 1849 was a public relations success, but it had no lasting impact or effect on the growth of Irish nationalism. Russell's ministry, the Whig, was not favoured by the Queen. She found particularly offensive the Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston, who often acted without consulting the Cabinet, the Prime Minister, or the Queen. Victoria complained to Russell that Palmerston sent official dispatches to foreign leaders without her knowledge, but Palmerston was retained in office and continued to act on his own initiative, despite her repeated remonstrances. It was only in 1851 that Palmerston was removed after he announced the British government's approval of President Louis Napoleon Bonaparte's coup in France without consulting the Prime Minister. The following year, President Bonaparte was declared Emperor Napoleon III, by which time Russell's administration had been replaced by a short-lived minority government led by Lord Derby. In 1853, Victoria gave birth to her eighth child, Leopold, with the aid of the new anesthetic, chloroform. Victoria was so impressed by the relief it gave from the pain of childbirth that she used it again in 1857 at the birth of her ninth and final child, Beatrice, despite opposition from members of the clergy, who considered it against biblical teaching, and members of the medical profession, who thought it dangerous. Victoria may have suffered from postnatal depression after many of her pregnancies. Letters from Albert to Victoria intermittently complain of her loss of self-control. For example, about a month after Leopold's birth Albert complained in a letter to Victoria about her continuance of hysterics over a miserable trifle. In early 1855, the government of Lord Aberdeen, who had replaced Derby, fell amidst recriminations over the poor management of British troops in the Crimean War. Victoria approached both Derby and Russell to form a ministry, but neither had sufficient support, and Victoria was forced to appoint Palmerston as Prime Minister. Napoleon III, since the Crimean War Britain's closest ally, visited London in April 1855, and from 17 to 28 August the same year Victoria and Albert returned the visit. Napoleon III met the couple at Boulogne and accompanied them to Paris. They visited the Exposition Universelle a successor to Albert's 1851 brainchild The Great Exhibition and Napoleon I's tomb at Les Invalides to which his remains had only been returned in 1840, and were guests of honour at a 1,200-guest ball at the Palace of Versailles. On 14 January 1858, an Italian refugee from Britain called Felice Orsini attempted to assassinate Napoleon III with a bomb made in England. The ensuing diplomatic crisis destabilised the government, and Palmerston resigned. Derby was reinstated as Prime Minister. Victoria and Albert attended the opening of a new basin at the French military port of Cherbourg on 5 August 1858, in an attempt by Napoleon III to reassure Britain that his military preparations were directed elsewhere. On her return Victoria wrote to Derby reprimanding him for the poor state of the Royal Navy in comparison to the French one. Derby's ministry did not last long, and in June 1859 Victoria recalled Palmerston to office. Eleven days after Orsini's assassination attempt in France, Victoria's eldest daughter married Prince Frederick William of Prussia in London. They had been betrothed since September 1855, when Princess Victoria was 14 years old. The marriage was delayed by the Queen and Prince Albert until the bride was 17. The Queen and Albert hoped that their daughter and son-in-law would be a liberalizing influence in the enlarging Prussian state. Victoria felt sick at heart to see her daughter leave England for Germany. It really makes me shudder. She wrote to Princess Victoria in one of her frequent letters, When I look round to all your sweet, happy, unconscious sisters, and think I must give them up too, one by one. Almost exactly a year later, Princess Victoria gave birth to the Queen's first grandchild, Wilhelm, who would become the last German emperor.
Topic: <inaudible> Widowhood. In March 1861, Victoria's mother died with Victoria at her side. Through reading her mother's papers, Victoria discovered that her mother had loved her deeply. She was heartbroken and blamed Conroy and Lezen for wickedly estranging her from her mother. To relieve his wife during her intense and deep grief, Albert took on most of her duties, despite being ill himself with chronic stomach trouble. In August, Victoria and Albert visited their son, Edward, Prince of Wales, who was attending army manoeuvres near Dublin, and spent a few days holidaying in Killarney. In November, Albert was made aware of gossip that his son had slept with an actress in Ireland. Appalled, Albert travelled to Cambridge, where his son was studying, to confront him. By the beginning of December, Albert was very unwell. He was diagnosed with typhoid fever by William Jenner, and died on 14 December 1861. Victoria was devastated. She blamed her husband's death on worry over the Prince of Wales's philandering. He had been killed by that dreadful business, she said. She entered a state of mourning and wore black for the remainder of her life. She avoided public appearances, and rarely set foot in London in the following years. Her seclusion earned her the nickname, Widow of Windsor. Her weight increased through comfort eating, which further reinforced her aversion to public appearances. Victoria's self imposed isolation from the public diminished the popularity of the monarchy, and encouraged the growth of the republican movement. She did undertake her official government duties, yet chose to remain secluded in her royal residences. Windsor Castle, Osborne House, and the private estate in Scotland that she and Albert had acquired in 1847, Balmoral Castle. In March 1864 a protester stuck a notice on the railings of Buckingham Palace that announced, "...these commanding premises to be let or sold in consequence of the late occupants declining business." Her uncle Leopold wrote to her advising her to appear in public. She agreed to visit the gardens of the Royal Horticultural Society at Kensington and take a drive through London in an open carriage. Through the 1860s, Victoria relied increasingly on a manservant from Scotland, John Brown. Slanderous rumours of a romantic connection and even a secret marriage appeared in print, and the Queen was referred to as Mrs. Brown. The story of their relationship was the subject of the 1997 movie Mrs. Brown. A painting by Sir Edwin Henry Landseer depicting the Queen with Brown was exhibited at the Royal Academy, and Victoria published a book, Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands, which featured Brown prominently and in which the Queen praised him highly. Palmerston died in 1865, and after a brief ministry led by Russell, Derby returned to power. In 1866, Victoria attended the state opening of Parliament for the first time since Albert's death. The following year she supported the passing of the Reform Act 1867 which doubled the electorate by extending the franchise to many urban working men, though she was not in favor of votes for women. Derby resigned in 1868, to be replaced by Benjamin Disraeli, who charmed Victoria. Everyone likes flattery, he said, and when you come to royalty you should lay it on with a trowel. With the phrase, we authors, ma'am, he complimented her. Disraeli's ministry only lasted a matter of months, and at the end of the year his liberal rival, William Ewart Gladstone, was appointed Prime Minister. Victoria found Gladstone's demeanour far less appealing, he spoke to her, she is thought to have complained, as though she were a public meeting rather than a woman. In 1870 Republican sentiment in Britain, fed by the Queen's seclusion, was boosted after the establishment of the Third French Republic. A Republican rally in Trafalgar Square demanded Victoria's removal, and radical MPs spoke against her. In August and September 1871, she was seriously ill with an abscess in her arm, which Joseph Lister successfully lanced and treated with his new antiseptic carbolic acid spray. In late November 1871, at the height of the Republican movement, the Prince of Wales contracted typhoid fever, the disease that was believed to have killed his father, and Victoria was fearful her son would die. As the tenth anniversary of her husband's death approached, her son's condition grew no better, and Victoria's distress continued. To general rejoicing, he recovered. Mother and son attended a public parade through London and a grand service of thanksgiving in St. Paul's Cathedral on 27 February 1872, and Republican feelings subsided. On the last day of February 1872, two days after the Thanksgiving service, 17 year old Arthur O'Connor, a great nephew of Irish MP Fergus O'Connor, waved an unloaded pistol at Victoria's open carriage just after she had arrived at Buckingham Palace. 
Brown, who was attending the Queen, grabbed him and O'Connor was later sentenced to 12 months imprisonment, and a birching. As a result of the incident, Victoria's popularity recovered further. <inaudible> Empress of India After the Indian Rebellion of 1857, the British East India Company, which had ruled much of India, was dissolved, and Britain's possessions and protectorates on the Indian subcontinent were formally incorporated into the British Empire. The Queen had a relatively balanced view of the conflict, and condemned atrocities on both sides. She wrote of her feelings of horror and regret at the result of this bloody civil war, and insisted, urged on by Albert, that an official proclamation announcing the transfer of power from the company to the state should breathe feelings of generosity, benevolence and religious toleration. At her behest, a reference threatening the undermining of native religions and customs was replaced by a passage guaranteeing religious freedom. In the 1874 general election, Disraeli was returned to power. He passed the Public Worship Regulation Act 1874, which removed Catholic rituals from the Anglican liturgy and which Victoria strongly supported. She preferred short, simple services, and personally considered herself more aligned with the Presbyterian Church of Scotland than the Episcopal Church of England. Disraeli also pushed the Royal Titles Act 1876 through Parliament, so that Victoria took the title Empress of India from 1 May 1876. The new title was proclaimed at the Delhi Durbar of the 1st of January 1877 on the 14th of December 1878, the anniversary of Albert's death. Victoria's second daughter Alice, who had married Louis of Hesse, died of diphtheria in Darmstadt. Victoria noted the coincidence of the dates as almost incredible and most mysterious. In May 1879, she became a great grandmother on the birth of Princess Theodora of Saxe-Meiningen and passed her poor old 60th birthday. She felt aged by the loss of my beloved child. Between April 1877 and February 1878, she threatened five times to abdicate while pressuring Disraeli to act against Russia during the Russo Turkish War, but her threats had no impact on the events or their conclusion with the Congress of Berlin. Disraeli's expansionist foreign policy, which Victoria endorsed, led to conflicts such as the Anglo Zulu War and the Second Anglo Afghan War. If we are to maintain our position as a first-rate power, she wrote, we must, be prepared for attacks and wars, somewhere or other. Continually, Victoria saw the expansion of the British Empire as civilizing and benign, protecting native peoples from more aggressive powers or cruel rulers. It is not in our custom to annex countries, she said, unless we are obliged and forced to do so. To Victoria's dismay, Disraeli lost the 1880 general election, and Gladstone returned as Prime Minister. When Disraeli died the following year, she was blinded by fast-falling tears, and erected a memorial tablet placed by his grateful sovereign and friend, Victoria R.I. Topic later years On 2 March 1882, Roderick MacLean, a disgruntled poet apparently offended by Victoria's refusal to accept one of his poems, shot at the Queen as her carriage left Windsor Railway Station. Two schoolboys from Eton College struck him with their umbrellas, until he was hustled away by a policeman. Victoria was outraged when he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, but was so pleased by the many expressions of loyalty after the attack that she said it was worth being shot at, to see how much one is loved. On 17 March 1883, she fell down some stairs at Windsor, which left her lame until July. She never fully recovered and was plagued with rheumatism thereafter. Brown died ten days after her accident, and to the consternation of her private secretary, Sir Henry Ponsonby, Victoria began work on a eulogistic biography of Brown. Ponsonby and Randall Davidson, Dean of Windsor, who had both seen early drafts, advised Victoria against publication, on the grounds that it would stoke the rumors of a love affair. The manuscript was destroyed. In early 1884, Victoria did publish more leaves from A Journal of a Life in the Highlands, a sequel to her earlier book, which she dedicated to her devoted personal attendant and faithful friend John Brown. On the day after the first anniversary of Brown's death, Victoria was informed by telegram that her youngest son, Leopold, had died in Cannes. He was the dearest of my dear sons, she lamented. The following month, Victoria's youngest child, Beatrice, met and fell in love with Prince Henry of Battenberg at the wedding of Victoria's granddaughter Princess Victoria of Hesse and by Rhine to Henry's brother Prince Louis of Battenberg. Beatrice and Henry planned to marry, but Victoria opposed the match at first, wishing to keep Beatrice at home to act as her companion. 
After a year, she was won around to the marriage by Henry and Beatrice's promise to remain living with and attending her. Victoria was pleased when Gladstone resigned in 1885 after his budget was defeated. She thought his government was the worst I have ever had, and blamed him for the death of General Gordon at Khartoum. Gladstone was replaced by Lord Salisbury. Salisbury's government only lasted a few months, however, and Victoria was forced to recall Gladstone, whom she referred to as a half-crazy and really in many ways ridiculous old man. Gladstone attempted to pass a bill granting Ireland home rule, but to Victoria's glee it was defeated. In the ensuing election, Gladstone's party lost to Salisbury's and the government switched hands again. Topic Golden Jubilee In 1887, the British Empire celebrated Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Victoria marked the 50th anniversary of her accession on 20 June with a banquet to which 50 kings and princes were invited. The following day, she participated in a procession and attended a thanksgiving service in Westminster Abbey. By this time, Victoria was once again extremely popular. Two days later on 23 June, she engaged two Indian Muslims as waiters, one of whom was Abdul Karim. He was soon promoted to Munshi, teaching her Urdu known as Hindustani and acting as a clerk. Her family and retainers were appalled, and accused Abdul Karim of spying for the Muslim Patriotic League, and biasing the Queen against the Hindus. Equerry Frederick Ponsonby the son of Sir Henry discovered that the Munshi had lied about his parentage, and reported to Lord Elgin, Viceroy of India, the Munshi occupies very much the same position as John Brown used to do. Victoria dismissed their complaints as racial prejudice. Abdul Karim remained in her service until he returned to India with a pension. On her death, Victoria's eldest daughter became Empress Consort of Germany in 1888, but she was widowed within the year, and Victoria's grandchild Wilhelm became German Emperor as Wilhelm II. Under Wilhelm, Victoria and Albert's hopes of a liberal Germany were not fulfilled. He believed in autocracy. Victoria thought he had little heart or zargeful tact and his conscience and intelligence have been completely warped sick Gladstone returned to power after the 1892 general election he was 82 years old Victoria objected when Gladstone proposed appointing the radical MP Henry Labusher to the cabinet so Gladstone agreed not to appoint him in 1894 Gladstone retired and without consulting the outgoing prime minister Victoria appointed Lord Rosebery as prime minister his government was weak, and the following year Lord Salisbury replaced him. Salisbury remained Prime Minister for the remainder of Victoria's reign. Topic Diamond Jubilee On 23 September 1896, Victoria surpassed her grandfather George III as the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen requested that any special celebrations be delayed until 1897, to coincide with her Diamond Jubilee, which was made a festival of the British Empire at the suggestion of the colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. The prime ministers of all the self-governing dominions were invited to London for the festivities. One reason for including the prime ministers of the dominions and excluding foreign heads of state was to avoid having to invite Victoria's grandson, Wilhelm II of Germany, who, it was feared, might cause trouble at the event. The Queen's Diamond Jubilee procession on the 22nd of June 1897 followed a route six miles long through London and included troops from all over the empire. The procession paused for an open-air service of thanksgiving held outside St. Paul's Cathedral, throughout which Victoria sat in her open carriage, to avoid her having to climb the steps to enter the building. The celebration was marked by vast crowds of spectators and great outpourings of affection for the 78-year-old Queen. Victoria visited mainland Europe regularly for holidays. In 1889, during a stay in Biarritz, she became the first reigning monarch from Britain to set foot in Spain when she crossed the border for a brief visit. By April 1900, the Boer War was so unpopular in mainland Europe that her annual trip to France seemed inadvisable. Instead, the Queen went to Ireland for the first time since 1861, in part to acknowledge the contribution of Irish regiments to the South African War. In July, her second son Alfred Affy died. Oh, God. My poor darling Afi gone too, she wrote in her journal. It is a horrible year, nothing but sadness and horrors of one kind and another. Topic death and succession Following a custom she maintained throughout her widowhood, Victoria spent the Christmas of 1900 at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Rheumatism in her legs had rendered her lame, and her eyesight was clouded by cataracts. Through early January, she felt weak and unwell, and by mid-January she was drowsy, dazed, and confused. 
She died on Tuesday, the 22nd of January 1901, at half past six in the evening, at the age of 81. Her son and successor, King Edward VII, and her eldest grandson, Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany, were at her deathbed. Her favorite pet Pomeranian, Turi, was laid upon her deathbed as a last request. In 1897, Victoria had written instructions for her funeral, which was to be military as befitting a soldier's daughter and the head of the army, and white instead of black. On 25 January, Edward VII, the Kaiser and Prince Arthur, Duke of Connaught, helped lift her body into the coffin. She was dressed in a white dress and her wedding veil. An array of mementos commemorating her extended family, friends and servants were laid in the coffin with her, at her request, by her doctor and dressers. One of Albert's dressing gowns was placed by her side, with a plaster cast of his hand, while a lock of John Brown's hair, along with a picture of him, was placed in her left hand concealed from the view of the family by a carefully positioned bunch of flowers. Items of jewellery placed on Victoria included the wedding ring of John Brown's mother, given to her by Brown in 1883. Her funeral was held on Saturday 2 February, in St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, and after two days of lying in state, she was interred beside Prince Albert in Frogmore Mausoleum at Windsor Great Park, with a reign of 63 years, seven months and two days. Victoria was the longest reigning British monarch and the longest reigning Queen Regnant in world history until her great-great-granddaughter Elizabeth II surpassed her on 9 September 2015. She was the last monarch of Britain from the House of Hanover. Her son and successor Edward VII belonged to her husband's house of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. <inaudible> Legacy According to one of her biographers, Giles Street Aubin, Victoria wrote an average of 2,500 words a day during her adult life. From July 1832 until just before her death, she kept a detailed journal, which eventually encompassed 122 volumes. After Victoria's death, her youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, was appointed her literary executor. Beatrice transcribed and edited the diaries covering Victoria's accession onwards, and burned the originals in the process. Despite this destruction, much of the diaries still exist. In addition to Beatrice's edited copy, Lord Esher transcribed the volumes from 1832 to 1861 before Beatrice destroyed them. Part of Victoria's extensive correspondence has been published in volumes edited by A.C. Benson, Hector Bolitha, George Earl Buckle, Lord Esher, Roger Fulford, and Richard Huff among others. Victoria was physically unprepossessing. She was stout, dowdy and only about five feet tall. But she succeeded in projecting a grand image. She experienced in popularity during the first years of her widowhood, but was well liked during the 1880s and 1890s, when she embodied the empire as a benevolent matriarchal figure. Only after the release of her diary and letters did the extent of her political influence become known to the wider public. Biographies of Victoria written before much of the primary material became available, such as Lytton Strachey's Queen Victoria of 1921, are now considered out of date. The biographies written by Elizabeth Longford and Cecil Woodham Smith, in 1964 and 1972 respectively, are still widely admired. They, and others, conclude that as a person Victoria was emotional, obstinate, honest, and straight-talking. Contrary to popular belief, her staff and family recorded that Victoria was immensely amused and roared with laughter. On many occasions, through Victoria's reign, the gradual establishment of a modern constitutional monarchy in Britain continued. Reforms of the voting system increased the power of the House of Commons at the expense of the House of Lords and the monarch. In 1867, Walter Bagueho wrote that the monarch only retained the right to be consulted, the right to encourage, and the right to warn. As Victoria's monarchy became more symbolic than political, it placed a strong emphasis on morality and family values, in contrast to the sexual, financial and personal scandals that had been associated with previous members of the House of Hanover and which had discredited the monarchy. The concept of the family monarchy with which the burgeoning middle classes could identify, was solidified. Victoria's links with Europe's royal families earned her the nickname, the Grandmother of Europe. Victoria and Albert had 42 grandchildren, of whom 34 survived to adulthood. Their living descendants include Elizabeth II, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Harold V of Norway, Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden, Margrethe II of Denmark, and Felipe VI of Spain. 
Victoria's youngest son, Leopold, was affected by the blood clotting disease Haemophilia B and two of her five daughters, Alice and Beatrice, were carriers. Royal haemophiliacs descended from Victoria included her great-grandsons, Alexei Nikolaevich, Sarevich of Russia, Alfonso, Prince of Asturias, and Infante Gonzalo of Spain. The presence of the disease in Victoria's descendants, but not in her ancestors, led to modern speculation that her true father was not the Duke of Kent but a haemophiliac. There is no documentary evidence of a haemophiliac in connection with Victoria's mother, and as male carriers always suffer the disease, even if such a man had existed he would have been seriously ill. It is more likely that the mutation arose spontaneously because Victoria's father was over 50 at the time of her conception and haemophilia arises more frequently in the children of older fathers. Spontaneous mutations account for about a third of cases. Around the world, places and memorials are dedicated to her, especially in the Commonwealth nations. Places named after her include Africa's largest lake, Victoria Falls, the capitals of British Columbia Victoria and Saskatchewan Regina, and two Australian states Victoria and Queensland. The Victoria Cross was introduced in 1856 to reward acts of valour during the Crimean War, and it remains the highest British, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand award for bravery. Victoria Day is a Canadian statutory holiday and a local public holiday in parts of Scotland celebrated on the last Monday before or on 24 May Queen Victoria's birthday. Topic. Titles, styles, honours and arms Topic. Titles and styles The 24th of May 1819 to the 20th of June 1837, Her Royal Highness Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Kent. The 20th of June 1837 to the 22nd of January 1901, Her Majesty the Queen at the end of her reign. The Queen's full style and title were Her Majesty Victoria, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Queen, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India. Topic. Honours Founder and Sovereign of the Order of the Star of India 1861 Founder and Sovereign of the Royal Order of Victoria and Albert 1861 Founder and Sovereign of the Order of the Crown of India 1878 Founder and Sovereign of the Distinguished Service Order 1886 Founder and Sovereign of the Royal Victorian Order 1896 Topic. Arms As sovereign, Victoria used the royal coat of arms of the United Kingdom. Before her accession, she received no grant of arms. As she could not succeed to the throne of Hanover, her arms did not carry the Hanoverian symbols that were used by her immediate predecessors. Her arms have been borne by all of her successors on the throne. Outside Scotland, the blazon for the shield, also used on the royal standard, is, quarterly, I and IV, gules, three lions passant gardent in pale or, for England, two, or, a lion rampant within a double treasure flory counter flory gules, for Scotland, three, azure, a harp or stringed argent, for Ireland. In Scotland, the first and fourth quarters are occupied by the Scottish lion, and the second by the English lions. The crests, mottos, and supporters also differ in and outside Scotland. Topic. Issue. Topic. Ancestry Topic. Notes and references Topic. Bibliography Topic. Published primary sources Benson, A. C., Esher, Viscount Editors, 1907. The Letters of Queen Victoria, a selection of Her Majesty's correspondence between the years 1837 and 1861, London, John Murray Bolitha, Hector editor, 1938 Letters of Queen Victoria from the Archives of the House of Brandenburg Prussia, London, Thornton Butterworth Buckle, George Earle editor, 1926. The Letters of Queen Victoria, 2nd Series 1862-1885, London, John Murray Buckle, George Earle, editor, 1930. 
The Letters of Queen Victoria, 3rd Series 1886–1901, London, John Murray Connell, Brian 1962, Regina v. Palmerston, The Correspondence Between Queen Victoria and Her Foreign and Prime Minister, 1837–1865, London, Evans Brothers Duff, David editor, 1968, Victoria in the Highlands, The Personal Journal of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, London, Muller Dyson, Hope, Tennyson, Charles editors, 1969, Dear and Honoured Lady, The Correspondence Between Queen Victoria and Alfred Tennyson, London, Macmillan Esher, Viscount editor, 1912. The Girlhood of Queen Victoria, a selection from Her Majesty's Diaries, 1832-40, London, John Murray Fulford, Roger editor, 1964, Dearest Child, Letters Between Queen Victoria and the Princess Royal, 1858-61, London, Evans Brothers Fulford, Roger editor, 1968, Dearest Mama, Letters Between Queen Victoria and the Crown Princess of Prussia, 1861-64, London, Evans Brothers Fulford, Roger editor, 1970. 71, Beloved Mama, Private Correspondence of Queen Victoria and the German Crown Princess, 1878–85, London, Evans Brothers Fulford, Roger editor, 1971. Your Dear Letter, Private Correspondence of Queen Victoria and the Crown Princess of Prussia, 1863–71, London, Evans Brothers Fulford, Roger editor, 1976 Darling Child, Private Correspondence of Queen Victoria and the German Crown Princess of Prussia, 1871–78, London, Evans Brothers Hibbert, Christopher editor, 1984 Queen Victoria in her Letters and Journals, London, John Murray, ISBN 0-7195-410 7, 7 Huff, Richard editor, 1975, Advice to a Granddaughter, Letters from Queen Victoria to Princess Victoria of Hesse, London, Heinemann, ISBN 0-434-34861-9 Jago, Kurt editor, 1938, Letters of the Prince Consort 1831-61, London, John Murray Mortimer, Raymond editor, 1961, Queen Victoria, Leaves from a Journal, New York, Farrar, Strauss and Cudahy Ponsonby, Sir Frederick editor, Editor, 1930 Letters of the Empress Frederick, London, Macmillan Ram, Agatha Editor, 1990 Beloved and Darling Child, Last Letters Between Queen Victoria and Her Eldest Daughter, 1886–1901, Stroud, Sutton Publishing, ISBN 978-0-86299-880-6 Victoria, Queen, 1868 Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands from 1848 to 1861, London, Smith, Elder Victoria, Queen, 1884 More Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands from 1862 to 1882, London, Smith, Elder Topic Further reading Arnstein, Walter L. 2003 Queen Victoria, New York, Palgrave Macmillan, ISBN 978-0-333-63806-4 Baird, Julia 2016 Victoria the Queen, An Intimate Biography of the Woman Who Ruled an Empire, New York, Random House, ISBN 978-1-4000-6 6988-O Gardiner, Juliet 1997 Queen Victoria, London, Collins & Brown, ISBN 978-1-85585-469-7 Leiden, N.M. 2014 A Royal Passion, Queen Victoria and Photography, Los Angeles, Getty Publications, ISBN 978-1-60606-155-8 Weintraub, Stanley 1987 Victoria, Biography of a Queen, London, HarperCollins, ISBN 978-0-04-923084-2 Wilson, A. N. Victoria, A Life, London, Atlantic Books, ISBN 978-1-84887-956-0 External links Victoria at Encyclopædia Britannica Archival material relating to Queen Victoria. UK National Archives Portraits of Queen Victoria at the National Portrait Gallery, London Queen Victoria's Journals, online from the Royal Archive and Bidleian Library Works by Queen Victoria at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Queen Victoria at Internet Archive Works by Queen Victoria at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Newspaper clippings about Queen Victoria in the 20th Century Press Archives of the German National Library of Economics ZBW.